exclusively to Julian Assange, the founder of the WikiLeaks website and the man behind the leaking of thousands of classified diplomatic cables. Julian, thanks for talking to RT. Now, through the course of your work, it's reasonable to assume that you have some insight into how uh, political decisions are being made. What do you make of the recent events in the Middle East and North Africa? Do you think that we're seeing genuine social unrest or are we seeing some kind of uh, orchestrated revolt? And if so, who do you think is behind all this? Well, there's genuine change in some parts of the Middle East. I mean, Egypt is a clear case. I was concerned at the beginning um, of the Egyptian revolution as to when, whether we just saw a changing of the chairs and, a, and a, a maintenance of the same existing power structure, whether something really different was happening. But after Mubarak uh, fled uh, Cairo, you saw many revolutions occurring in every institution within Egypt, um, from Alexandria to Cairo. Um, so that, that's the sort of change that's hard to undo. Now, What's happening in some other countries is a bit different. So the situation in Libya uh, is clearly has the involvement of state actors in it from many different areas. Um, that's something that's been driven by state actors. Now, it is normal for neighbouring countries uh, to have interconnections with each other. Um, the activists in different countries, families in different countries, businesses in different countries, uh, and the states uh, from neighbouring countries. That's normal. When outside forces from very, very far-flung countries start to take an aggressive role uh, in a regional affair, um, then we have to look a bit more and say that what's going on is not normal. So what's happening in Libya, for example, is not normal. And social networking, what role do you think sites like Facebook and Twitter have played in the revolutions in the Middle East? How easy would you say it is to manipulate media like that? Facebook in particular um, is the most appalling spying machine that has ever been invented. Um, here we have the world's most comprehensive database about people, their relationships, their names, their addresses, their locations, um, their communications with each other, their relatives, all sitting within the United States, all accessible to US intelligence. Facebook, Google, Yahoo, all these major US organizations have built-in interfaces for US intelligence. It's not a matter of serving a subpoena. They have an interface that they have developed for US intelligence to use. Now, is it the case that Facebook um, is actually run by US intelligence? No, it's not like that. It's simply that US intelligence is able to bring to bear legal and political pressure to them and it's costly for them to hand out records and, uh, one by one, so they have automated the process. Everyone should understand that, that they, when they add their friends to Facebook, they are doing free work for United States intelligence agencies in building this database for them. Let's talk about uh, other latest sort of WikiLeaks cables that have been released. Um, they show the UK as a haven for extremism, with at least uh, 35 uh, Guantanamo detainees having at least passed through the UK. Is the UK still a haven for terrorists? I don't know if it's still been a haven for terrorists, but it is certainly a haven for um, oligarchs and uh, former regime dictators that have come here. I mean, you remember the famous Pinochet uh, trial um, for the extradition of Pinochet from the UK, uh, which the, the Thatcher um, resisted, um, incredibly using a, a lawyer that is involved in, in trying to extradite me from the United Kingdom. Um, now, part of that is perhaps good. It's an example of true liberalism in the United Kingdom. Everyone come here, we'll protect you. Uh, on the other hand, there does seem to be a disconnect between is it really supporting uh, free speech activists like me who come to the UK, um, but on the other hand, um, it is uh, supporting people like uh, sons of um, Gaddafi. And the, the Guantanamo information, why has WikiLeaks released it now? I mean, it, it seems sort of, sort of to, be, to be after the fact. Is it because Obama has recently announced his re-election campaign and obviously closing Guantanamo was one of his main election promises? Well, there's a number of reasons why we've released it now. Um, the primary one is that we are a small organisation, a very committed one, 
Um, and last year we came under extraordinary attack. All these things continue to go on. And so they really dampen down our ability to move quickly and publish quickly. The timing is good. Obama has given up on closing Guantanamo and has decided to reopen the trial process. Um, and we now have a situation where the, even the Obama administration says that 48 of these people still in Guantanamo are completely innocent and that they should be sent somewhere and they're not being sent somewhere. So completely innocent people incarcerated for years and years and years, no trial and no hope um, of relief. No, no country will agree to house them, including the United States, but the United States uh, has made them its problem. Um, the United States was involved in rounding up these uh, innocent people setting up a process that was from the very beginning corrupt. There's a reason why they're in Guantanamo and not on the US mainland and not in an allied country. And that reason was to hide them and keep them outside of the law. Just like you have Caribbean islands engaged in money laundering, the United States was engaged in people laundering. Let's move on and talk about your uh, media partners, uh, one of which is The Guardian, with whom you're now involved in a dispute. But you chose them as your primary English language partner for distributing the WikiLeaks cables. And now Guardian journalists have published this book on WikiLeaks, which you say is an attack on you. Um, how would you describe, following that, the Guardian's, the Guardian's stance on whistleblowing and media freedom in general? You know, they, they are, they are a, a publishing organisation, so, of course, they want as much right for them to publish as, as possible. That's a natural um, self-interest. Um, what they have done um, with this cable cooking um, in this incredible redaction, um, over-redaction of cables, is they have pushed the right of the people to know at the very, very edge. And what they're concerned about is any possible attack on them. But we have seen this sort of abuse um, of the material that we have provided um, several times. And the, Guardi the Guardian is the worst offender, but we saw it also by the New York Times. The New York Times redacted a 62-page cable down to two paragraphs. And this is completely against the agreement that we originally set up with them on November the 1st last year. That agreement was that the only redactions that should take place are to protect people's lives. There should be no other um, reduction, not to protect reputation, uh, not, not to protect um, the Guardian's profits, uh, but only to protect lives. What happens in the West is that there is no border between state interest and commercial interest. The, the edges of the state, as a result of privatisation, um, are fuzzed and blurred out into the edges of companies. And so when you look at how The Guardian behaves or how The New York Times behaves, um, it is part of that mesh of corporate and state interests, seamlessly blurring into each other. The Guardian's concerned predominantly about uh, being criticised by these powerful interests, about um, lawsuits occurring against it, um, driven by um, oligarchs, driven by people powerful enough uh, to push um, a court case forward. Let's talk a little bit about you and what you're going through at the moment. Um, you are currently uh, fighting extradition to Sweden. What are your fears should you be extradited there? The problem uh, is in two parts. Um, the United States is trying to get up an extradition case for me to the United States. Um, just uh, today we see a new subpoena coming out of the secret grand jury uh, that is operating in Alexandria, Virginia is trying to get up this um, espionage case against us. Um, it is um, building that case and in whatever country I am in, once it decides to indict, they will try to extradite me uh, from that country. And possibly not just me, possibly our other staff. The other problem uh, with the Swedish expedition uh, is that um, the process itself uh, has been corrupted. Um, so it was corrupted from the very beginning. And we've seen corruption in the Swedish media. We've seen um, uh, all sorts of strange actions in relation to how the, this case has progressed. 
What message do you think it would send to the world if the UK did turn around almost unexpectedly at this point, it seems, and refuse to extradite you? Well, it depends on to which country. So here's the sort of calculation that's going on in the United Kingdom. Um, the United Kingdom wants to keep, at the various levels, wants to keep its good relationship with the United States. Um, so if the UK was to reject the US extradition order, that would pose terrible problems for it. Similarly, if it was to reject the Swedish extradition order, that would pose problems for it, because it, it would look like it was seeking to harbour me. Um, and this is the, the sort of difficult situation that, that Afghanistan faced, where it appeared that it was harbouring um, bin Laden, and as a result there was an aggressive response. So any country which appears to be harbouring us um, as the United States is trying to conduct its aggressive response, um, faces political pressures. If the United Kingdom um, does attempt uh, to extradite me to the United States, um, then it, it faces a difficult position politically, which is the bulk of the people in the United Kingdom support us. And finally, Julian, who do you consider to be your number one enemy? Well, our number one enemy is ignorance. Um, and I believe that is the number one enemy of everyone, uh, is not understanding what is actually going on in the world. It's only when you start to understand that you can make effective decisions and effective plans. Now, the question is, who is promoting ignorance? Well, those organisations that try to keep things secret um, and those organisations which distort true information to make it false or misrepresentative. In this latter category, um, it is bad media. Um, it, it really is my, my opinion that the media in general are so bad, um, we would have to question whether the world wouldn't be better off without them altogether. Um, they're so distortive to how the world actually is um, that the result is we see um, wars and we see corrupt governments continue on. One of the hopeful things that I've discovered is that nearly every war that has started in the past 50 years has been a result of media lies. The media could have stopped it if they had searched deep enough, if they hadn't um, reprinted government propaganda, they could have stopped it. But what does that mean? Well, that means basically populations don't like wars. And populations have to be fooled into wars. Populations don't willingly and op with open eyes go into a war. So if we have a good media environment, then we'll also have a peaceful environment. Julian Assange, thank you very much.